organizers for inviting us here. It's a real honor, and I just want to compliment you on how well this whole thing has been organized. It's, I've really enjoyed it. So we're here to talk about future directions. Uh, so now for something <laughs> completely different. Um, I think that they invited us here to talk about future directions because Laura and some of the other folks know that at the School of Design at Carnegie Mellon, we just came off a multi-year process of trying to completely redesign all of our programs and curricula at the undergraduate, masters, and doctoral levels all at the same time. So we had to be thinking about the future a lot. And it occurred to me yesterday when I was sitting in the audience looking out at it that there's probably a fair number of people here today that don't even remember a time when service design wasn't either an emerging or an established area of design focus. And then there's a whole other group of us that remember when it was just a speck off on the horizon, you know, way out there. It was this idea that everybody started talking about and then it began to gather momentum until look at today. You can have an entire two-day conference and have people from all around the world more or less agree on how to exchange tools, have conversations, and begin to deepen the, the conversation. So that's pretty exciting. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the process we went through and our new framework, and in particular, an area that we're calling transition design that we think might be one of those little specks off on the horizon. Uh, and then Cameron is going to talk about uh, service design itself and how it's undergoing a transition as well. So the evolution of service design has helped initiate a trend towards values-based designing and has heightened awareness of design as a catalyst for transformative positive change in areas such as health and well-being, education, policy, energy, transport, and as we've heard at this conference, many others. So because of this, we think that service design has become a key component in designing for transition. And at the same time, service design itself, we think, is undergoing a transition. So I want to talk to you today about the design school within the context of being a service provider with all of the associated tensions and conflicts that that brings. So when you think about it, a design school serves tuition-paying students and promises them earning capacity, hopefully in excess of the cost of their education, which uh, is more and more debatable, I think, in this day and age. We serve society, particularly with our new program, we hope, by creating designers who work to make the world a better place. We're researchers, as well, that are, who are trying to understand what befits the needs of society and the marketplace now and in the future. But we're also experts with knowledge about what befits the needs of society and the marketplace now and in the future. But we're also critics with knowledge about the conflict between the needs of society and the marketplace now and in the future. So our new curriculum could be seen as a service-oriented response to the current contexts within which we see our graduates designing. And it's also, unabashedly, a values-based response intended to leapfrog beyond current contexts and even paradigms, I would say, and anticipate where we can and should be designing in the long-term future. So an area in particular that we're going to talk about in a moment is called design for transitions. It's about systems level change in the long-term future. And we actually are passing out a little gift so you won't throw tomatoes at us. It's a 32-page monograph that we've put out on transition design. And the caveat is this was really uh, developed for an academic audience to begin with because we've been in conversation with other design educators about some of the ideas, um, hoping that it will, the conversation will be taken up, not just by us, but other folks as well. 
So the framework for our new curriculum is quite ambitious. We wanted to see if we could unify programs and ideas at all levels in the program. And at the meta level, we say that we are a school of design for interactions. And very importantly, we say that those are interactions between people, the built or the designed world, and the natural environment. And I think that that often gets left out of the conversation. At the undergraduate level, we have tracks in products, communications, and a new track called environments, which acknowledges that we are often designing communications and products that come together within complex environments that are both analog and digital, and increasingly a hybrid of both. We also have three areas of design focus in which product, projects and research at the undergrad and master's level is situated. And it's design for service, design for social innovation, and transition design. Now, before you get upset, let me just say that this is the way we're talking about them. And it's important to understand that we are talking about framing design for service within existing socioeconomic paradigms. And you might be working in the nonprofit sector or in the business sector, but we situate those projects and research within the service design context in existing paradigms. I also want to say that ours is one of the programs in which service design has been a key component ever since almost its beginnings, and that's largely thanks to Shelley Evanson, who used to be, <laughs> who was on our faculty and was one of those key people that looked out on the horizon and said, that's really important. And I think it's also important to remember that when these new future directions emerge, I think that they're most meaningful and they gather the most momentum when it's a combination of practitioners and educators working together to try and map out the territory and understand what it means. So we also talk to the students about design for social innovation or design for social impact. There's a huge debate raging right now on what the right terminology is. And frankly, I get really tired of these semantic debates. But the point here is that we are trying to get students to think about developing solutions within alternative socioeconomic paradigms, or at the very least, begin to question the ones that we are all embedded in. So we're all embedded in, a, in an economic paradigm that is largely predicated on, upon growth and profit. I myself am embedded in one of those. I start the year out way short of my allocation, and I have to spend inordinate amounts of time worrying about how to plug that financial gap. But at this level, we really want students to start to question whether or not the existing socioeconomic paradigms, should they be the status quo? Can we begin to design an alternative to them? Can we begin to challenge and critique them? We've also developed a new area that we're calling transition design, which is about design-led societal transition to more sustainable futures. That's a mouthful. Let me say that again. It's about design-led societal transition to more sustainable futures, and we intentionally put a plural on that. So at that level, we're really talking about the reconception of entire lifestyles. So if at this end of the spectrum, we are all, all of us, largely working on business propositions or nonprofit propositions within existing paradigms, at that end, how are we going to reconceive lifestyles to be place-based and sustainable in a situation in which the economy and the societal structures exist to help people meet needs and live sustainable lives in place. So the pamphlet that we've passed out to you attempts to begin to have a conversation. And just as we tell our students, hold it lightly. It's a sketch, even though it's printed. It's a sketch. It's a beginning of a conversation to say, OK, as we begin to solidify what service design is, what else is out there on the horizon? 
And sometimes these things turn into a movement or an area of focus like service design. Sometimes they simply spark conversations that give rise to new tools and new sources that inform what we're doing today. So a really important part of this framework is that we always say to our students, all of what you design is embedded within the larger social and natural worlds. And I think, again, the environment gets left out of this. So one of the, the big parts about transition design is designing in and for place. So we have this transition design framework, and I'm going to scoot through this so I can hand it off to Cameron. A big part of this is about us questioning whether it is possible to rigorously envision long-term futures. There are more and more streams of thought and processes for doing this. And I don't mean over the next three years or five years. I mean like the 2050 initiatives that many, many businesses are now taking up in which these long-term visions actually become a magnet or a compass by which projects of all kinds in the present can be conceived. And then once these visions are shared, you can actually begin to link up previously unrelated projects towards the realization of these longer-term visions. And again, I'm not going to go into this too deeply, but hopefully what we passed out will make it clearer. So transition solutions might actually involve constellations of both projects for design for service as well as social innovation. And what makes them a transition solution is their connection to mid and long-term visions in which you're amplifying and connecting existing efforts and developing narratives and glimpses of the not yet. So in our handout, what I hope will also be valuable, I'm a sucker for bibliographies and book lists. I don't know if you guys are, but we have tried to compile a really comprehensive um, sharing of, of uh, resources. The other thing I want to talk about, and then I think I'm going to wrap it up, is posture. One of the important things transition design does is it says, how do we as practitioners in this space need to change ourselves? What kind of postures and mindsets do we need to take up? And maybe it involves self-reflection and change on our, on our own. And I don't think that is commonly discussed, or it certainly hasn't been taught beyond, say, collaborative. Um, how to collaborate better. I think this involves more mindfulness and self-reflection and probably stepping out of postures of certainty and into postures of speculation. Cameron, I'm going to turn this over to you. I'm, okay. going, I'm going over. Thanks, Terry. <clears throat> so I think as, as Terry's indicated, uh, can you hear me because I yell loudly anyway? <clears throat> so I think as Terry's indicated, uh, it's very nice being at a university. We have the enormous privilege of being able to speculate and being able to have value frameworks. And often if we come to an event like this, people say, well, it would be nice to do that, but uh, we have clients, etc." Uh, I think, uh, by the way, it's not only a privilege, it is in fact a responsibility of a university when it's running programs to be doing that. I think a program that is only servicing current needs is not fulfilling the responsibility of being a university. But I would also like to like, spend the next 15 minutes talking to you about the ways in which uh, the sorts of things that we're talking about we think are not only desirable for our society, but are starting to become necessary for actual service design practitioners now. So I'm going to give you some examples of some of the work that we see going around that seems to demand something like transition design. So I'm starting with this uh, particular picture, although it goes precisely to the GE presentation we saw yesterday about the Internet of Things. And uh, this was actually produced by an alumni of our program. Uh, Megan Neese actually published this article uh, for Epic in which she talks about the ways in which a car that is connected is no longer a car. And part of the designer's job is then going to be deciding what actually is the product. What actually is the service? What actually is the system? Bounding this system becomes incumbent upon the designer, obviously not as an imposition, always with co-creation, uh, research-led, etc. But it actually becomes necessary for the designer to do this kind of ontological framing of what domain I'm in. 
because we're starting to move into this kind of interconnectedness. This quite literally demands a kind of place-based response in the way Megan Neese framed it, uh, or something like a values framework. So what you can now see is that service design broke, let's say, with interaction design, and it became its own thing, enough to fill an entire theater. But you're now seeing it reflecting back on the whole of interaction design. You're now seeing a number of people in the UX and IXD space uh, actually struggling to catch up and understand because service design knows things about making those sorts of decisions that IXD uh, doesn't. So the fact that all these IXD people are getting jobs as product managers means that their job is to define the product. And to do that, they need to understand something about service. So these are our colleagues at CMU, uh, Jody and John, uh, who are starting to indicate that, in fact, all interaction design should be done through a service design framework, which becomes a very interesting proposition. Another way to put this is to use a very conventional box. And again, we've heard a lot of this today, and, uh, and again, particularly in relation to the GE. And we could say that. Uh, Designers are now in this space trying to decide where the offering should be. And it might be something like a smart product, it might be something like an even smarter product, like a, a robot, although a robot's a funny term, but it's just being used for something that is uh, slightly more proactive in that domain. But then one can also see this happening in relation to the service sector. And so a lot of what I haven't been hearing too much at the conference is uh, uh, good accounts of different ontologies of service, different accounts of when it is DIY, different accounts of when it's peer-to-peer, -peer, or when it's a full expert service, for example. And so now you start to see that the space of interaction designers and service designers is overlapping, and the, the point for a designer is to make these sorts of decisions and to actually try and create a thing. And I don't mean literally a physical thing. I mean when you say on social media, is that a thing now? This is the job of, a, of the designer. This is precisely the space between service and interaction design. This is why you start to become a transition designer. You are transitioning society into a world in which that is now a thing. One of the other things that's going on when you make that decision is you're starting to look at different economies. Terry indicated that it's a very stark contrast between uh, existing economies, alternative economies, and then hopefully something like a sustainable economy. And that's a nice value proposition to, as a university, have the luxury to promote. But in fact, what you're also seeing is that all service designers and all interaction designers are now playing with something like a matrix like this. They're trying to decide where the trade-off is. They're trying to decide what the asset is. They're trying to work out their particular market. Does it have time or money? Does it have skills or does it know people? Now, this already is a very different economic exchange. This is not your standard uh, capitalist transaction of handing over money. This now becomes a blurring with what is being called the sharing economy or the collaborative economy. All service design and all interaction design is now in this space. And it creates a number of particular problems for the service design world. We come to a conference and we talk about service design, but we understand it to be a very broad church in which there is a wide range of different types of service being supplied in which we're all working on very different balances between people, money, time, and skills. But, and the one thing I'm not hearing enough of at this conference is, this is not only about us, this is about the people we are designing. Not the people we are designing for customers, but the people we are designing, employees. When we make service design decisions, we are also determining what is the nature of a job. And we understand that jobs and employment is in flux at the moment for these very same sorts of reasons. And so service designers are not just designing things, they're actually designing lives. Designing lifestyles is not an ambition, it becomes a necessity. And we need to begin to take political responsibility for that. Again, this is something that's starting to be recognized. A recent paper in the Journal of Service Research, which did a very large survey of what is the state of service research, recently came out. And one of the key points they made is the lack of uh, understanding of employees in service research. We talk about organizations and structures. We talk about organizational change. We talk about knowing users and knowing customers but I've heard very little about knowing employees, knowing the lives of employees. And this is recognized as a deficit in the area, and there's a call in the Journal of Service Research to correct it. 
And so you begin playing in a space in which we are all participating in actually changing society. Whether you like it or not, you're a transition designer. You are transitioning natures of employment. This was a beautiful piece done by Rachel Abrams, uh, um, Turnstone Consulting, an incredible uh, piece done for OSU, uh, in which she was just putting together the kind of arrival of a gig economy with reproductive uh, politics, uh, particularly looking at the workplace and the role of women, uh, the fact that leaning in is uh, a fairly uh, idealistic strategy, and that what uh, neoliberal societies are in fact doing is just saying, embrace freelanceness so that you have the flexibility to go and have children. Engage in the sharing economy so that you can actually get childcare because we as an employer can't provide it to you. And as we all heard, governments are, are so austere that they don't provide it either, unless you live in Scandinavia. And so this is the domain in which we're in. The argument here is transition design is a nice idealistic ambition for a privileged university to start pushing about, but it's in fact something that I think you are all working in already. When you design services, you are designing encounters between people. Very beautiful PhD done by uh, uh, Carla and Ezio, or Ezio looking after this work that Carla did, really starting to look at existential philosophy as the very understanding of these encounters. You are creating fulfillments, you are creating value, not just employment, but whether it is, as Dave Graeber says, a shit job, or whether it is in fact as rewarding as all of your work. Or is it that only service designers in the creative class get the nice jobs and just tell everybody else to do the shit jobs? So I think one way to begin to understand this is to recognise that all of you, and we've heard some of it uh, again yesterday in relation to AMP, I heard extensive talk of uh, organisational change and some of the innovations occurring there. And that's because all service design is learning design. You are changing people. We spend a lot of time talking about how to change customers, how to teach them, how to sculpt the service scapes so that they are oriented in particular directions, how to actually, uh, as we just heard in the session before in Singapore, how to actually create a, a graphic design in the letters that literally tell them they're about to get fined by the Singaporean government. So we spend a lot of time pushing customers around but what we take for granted is that we are also pushing employees around. Now, I say this, I'm sure you are all aware of it at the front line of doing a service design job. It's just that it's not that present in the discourse. It's certainly not present in the research discourse. And I'm saying I'm not hearing enough of it here. So I think it's very interesting to understand that every service design is transitioning people into different types of lifestyles, different types of value constellations, different types of relationships. Relationships <coughs> with their Co-workers, relationships with their bosses, relationship with other people in their society. And this is starting to be a very messy space in which I don't understand whether you are a peer or an employee or an employer. This is the space that we are sculpting. We are making things in this particular area. And again, we call it transition design because we're calling up a bunch of discourses that are kicking around, particularly Northern Europe at the moment, called uh, transition management, transition theory, coming out of a lot of uh, Dutch socio-technical innovation policy. Uh, so we've named it that also to pick up transition towns in the UK, for instance. But it is already a discourse a little bit, uh, so this was Daniela's beautiful piece on transformative service design. So there are some indications that this is starting and to some extent, I'm here to say we need more of this. We need to recognise that this huge room filled with very smart people doing incredibly important work needs to work harder and more. It's not enough to deliver value to the client. You are in the process of the very front line of changing the nature of employment and economies. So there's rich work here to draw on in terms of... Uh, <clears throat> Yes, and I am running for president. I will take out, uh, sorry, all right. <laughs> the birthers will have a lot of trouble with me trying to go for a US president. So I think what we're trying to say is that transition design is an ambition. It has idealism. It has a utopian quality quite explicitly. It is about these visions, as Terry indicated. It's trying to pull a series of existing initiatives into particular political discourses. It's trying to make change towards sustainability. But I'm kind of arguing at this point, unfortunately, you are already doing that. You are already in this mess, though it's quite beautiful in these pastel colours. <laughs> you are already in this very space. 
And so we would certainly welcome learning from you about the cases in which you are not only servicing a client, but putting in place a platform that enables other types of behaviours later on, so that you are in multi-level, multi-stage transitions. You're not just doing one project which can be presented as a case study nice and clean, thank you, it was all finished, we got paid, we even won an award for it, but rather that these things continue. What do you do with the projects once you've put them in place? And so this is the framework of transition design. My last kind of point is just to say, uh, quite literally, to get very pragmatic and prosaic about it. Uh, I do worry, or I'm interested to hear, let's say I'll put it as a question so it's not a provocation, I'm interested to hear whether we've actually got the right organisational structure as service designers to do what I'm talking about whether it's the idealistic version that we at uh, Carnegie Mellon promote or whether it's actually the kind of picture that you're already in, I do wonder at the moment, the acquisitions that have been going on seem to be an indication that small consultancies are not big enough to do the longer term projects. And yet on the other hand, we're seeing a lot of management consultants recognising that just commoditizing their offerings is also not enough. They need to be present with clients over the long term. They need to understand humans a lot better than just commodified delivery of management consultant tends to. And so there's this question around transition design, which is how do we design the very organisations that enable us to transition service design into transition design? It's a question I am wondering whether we have the right scale and what it would actually mean to form alliances between service designers in different consultancies, different institutions around the world so that you can begin to create constellations that amount to platforms. If AMP is doing something very interesting, creating new value propositions in Australia and GE is doing something around actually creating new types of pipelines somewhere else, when you put these two things together, do they amount to a sustainable future? What is the thing that you put in place there? What is the next design? Maybe the entrepreneurial one because there's no client. What is the one that you put there that would enable these two to come together and move forward? Only a question. I'm an academic. That's the privilege I get to ask them without answering them. I wait for students to put up their hands. So thank you very much. <laughs>